Hi, everybody. This is Rachel and this is Redhead Media. I have a column here on the Francisco Book Review. And I'm very excited today to be interviewing Karen Condasian. If you haven't heard of Karen, where have you been? <laughs> She's both an actor, well, I guess a triple threat here, actor, writer, and producer. And Karen was born in Boston, Massachusetts. At the age of eight, Karen was chosen to be one of the infamous children on Art Link Letters, Kids Say the Darndest Things. And she was very excited about that because she got to miss school. And uh, we'll talk about this, and she'll give you some of the specifics. I don't want to give it away. Um, she then went on to um, complete her schooling at San Francisco State, the University of Vienna, and the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. She starred opposite Ed Harris in The Sweet Bird of Youth, Richard Chamberlain in Richard II, Stacey Keach in Hamlet, uh, Ray Strickland in, I don't know how to say this, <laughs> v Vucre. Vucre. Okay, I'm yes. <laughs> And um, she also produced that. And um, Broken Eggs as well off Broadway. She won the Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle Award for Best Actress in The Rose Tattoo, which was written by Tennessee Williams. He saw her in that and was so impressed that they became lifelong friends, and he gave her carte blanche to produce any of the work in his lifetime. Karen's won a number of awards and nominations for her acting career, and she uh, also has starred on television in CBS's Shannon, over 50 television shows and films, including TNT's James Dean with James Franco, NYPD Blue, Frasier, Steel Big, Steel Little with Alan Arkin, and Yes, Giorgio with Luciano Pavarotti. Karen is a lifetime member of the Actors Studio and a member of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, as well as a member of Women in Film. And she occasionally teaches at the Lee Strasberg School of Theater and Film in Hollywood. Because we're here today, we're actually talking about Karen's award-winning novel, The Whip, which won the USA News Award for Best Historical Fiction. It was featured on the cover of Publishers Weekly uh, a year ago, I guess, when you released it. And um, she's also the author of the best-selling book, The Actors Encyclopedia of Casting Directors, with a forward by Richard Dreyfuss. So welcome, Karen. I'm very excited to be here talking with you today. Thank you, Rachel. I'm glad to be here. So, I think I'm going to um, hire you as my PR agent because of your <laughs> wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh, you're quite welcome. You've done so much. Can you tell us a little bit about The Whip, your, what it is, your inspiration? The book actually is my debut novel. Um, it, 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 is, it took me six years and 27 drafts to do it. Wow. Um, I when I was a girl... Um, I remember reading an article in, in a magazine. I think it was Cosmopolitan magazine. <laughs> I was always trying to find out how to, how to get a man. And, 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 and there just happened to be this actual, uh, very interesting article about wild women of the Old West. And, and in it was this story of this woman who lived her life as a man in the Old West and carried off this amazing feat. Uh, and became a really famous stagecoach driver, a Wells Fargo stagecoach driver, and rode up and down the coast of California. And her name was Charlie Parkhurst. And she, um, she carried this off for 30 years, actually. And when they got a, her ready for her funeral, uh, they were preparing her body. They could mm -hmm. not believe that the very famous Charlie Parkhurst was a woman. So doctors came from everywhere, San Francisco, to check out the body. They, uh, and she had had a child. Uh, she was also the first woman to vote in America as a man. So after reading about all of this, I, I really wanted to sit down and, and, and try to write something about this fascinating woman because I had so many questions. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, you know, <laughs> you know these these guys, these macho stagecoach drivers. They they did everything together. They slept together. They ate together. They peed together. <laughs> and so you yeah. know, I was thinking, how did she carry this off? So you know, I started out just on a yellow legal pad, answering questions about this character. And then my mother passed away, and obviously, I had a lot of. Uh, 
deep feelings, and I thought, why don't I use this, these feelings and this energy and this uh, uh, that I have, and and write through it um, okay. about my mom, and uh, you know, you when I say about my mom, meaning my my feelings about my mom, and mm-hmm. so I did, and uh, it it as I say, it took a long time, but I completed it, and I'm very grateful because. Apparently, this woman has given inspiration to other readers about surviving. The book is really, if you look at it, it, the river that runs through the book is about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And we all have that in our lives, dealing with with pain and and, and, and the possibility of revenge and or forgiveness. And that's what this is about. I mean, I, I ask you this question, Rachel, if... Yeah. Someone destroyed horribly everything in your life, your children, your husband, your family. Could you forgive them? That's a, that's a very difficult question. I read the book. I loved it. And I have to say, when, when some, very, some of those types of things did happen in the book, because I don't want to give anything away, I, did, I cried. I, I loved how you wrote it with so much emotion. I could definitely feel that. And so it's interesting to hear that you um, had lost your mother. I am sorry about that, of course, um, and how you were able to channel that into yes. your writing because it is very emotionally written, and I, I compliment you on that. Mm-hmm. I also felt that the book was, was very visual, and I found myself wanting to, <laughs> to cast it in my head, you know, young Charlie <laughs> and then older Charlie. <laughs> Do you find did you did you have anyone in mind as you were writing or would, if if a movie does come out of the book? Actually, Jennifer Lawrence would be amazing, and the reason is that she could start out you know as a young eighteen seventeen year old and then age up, um, yeah. and she also has that kind of she has a look she can be very powerful and and, and masculine kind of when she mm-hmm. uh, you know she has that. She has a coldness that she can bring to roles. I mean, she's a great actress, but she has that mm-hmm. authority, I guess is the word I'm trying to think, say. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, you know, last night I saw a movie, I think it was called Beyond the Pines, and, and I never thought of Ryan Gosling, but for Lee, you know, the role of Lee. Yeah. Um, oh, he yeah. would be wonderful, you know, the, yeah. the, the ultimate bad boy. Because when I was writing that role, I was thinking of James Dean, who had been, of course, one of my iconic figures of my tiny youth when I was very young. It's a, it's a, it's, it's in the Western era. Oh my God, Clint Eastwood would be amazing to direct. But Mm -hmm. those are all dreams, and we all have dreams, you know. And and and, but you ask the question, and yeah, that's that's who I I see in it. So let's go to when you first started out in acting. You were cast in Art Linkletter's show. Can you give us a little bit of information? How did that come about and what was that like? And was that life-changing for you? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> I, was eight, I was eight years old. Uh, they came to our school and interviewed. I guess they were looking for kind of peculiar, eccentric children who would say anything. And um, I was one of those children. And so I got chosen, and um, when I got on the air, he asked all of us what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I said I wanted to be a spy. And, but I said, no more, I want to be an actress. And he said, why? And I said, because I get to miss school, and, I, and you, get, you gave me my favorite lunch, grilled cheese and sandwiches and orange sherbet, and, and so I know that actresses get all the free grilled cheese sandwiches and orange sherbet they want, and they get to miss school, so that's the life for me. So um, he kind of laughed, Great. and that was the end of that. And guess what? I never wavered. You know, in life, it's so interesting to look back about the choices that we make and where they come from. I always like to do that. And many times even, not in this case, but many times even out of a bad situation, if that bad situation hadn't happened, you know, the glorious thing that we hold in our hands now it would not have been possible and would not have happened. And yeah. in the book, I don't know if you remember, I say, in every problem, there's a gift in its hand, and we create the problem because we need the gift. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you know, I believe that in life. Yeah, it's true. Um, I definitely agree with that. And, and we all learn from those things. And I think it's a matter of where you take it that it can be life-changing for you. So that Yes, is, you can either it, turn it against yourself or you can use it, open it up, and, and try to help other people with the knowledge and the, the emotional knowledge that you get from the experience. Now, speaking of that, did you feel that your experience as an actress and, and of course, some of your life experiences helped you uh, with regard to writing? Because your background is, was always acting. Or did you write all along and then just got no. to the point where you, okay. I've always been, in, I've always read. I've been a voracious reader. But uh, the thing that's interesting that I, I discovered is I believe that, writers if they have the willpower and the perseverance and the dedication can be some of the best writers because we get a kind of training um, mm-hmm. that it helps me a great deal in my writing. Um, one of the things being, you know, you said it was the, the book was very visual, that it was almost yes. like a film when you read yes. it. Um, mm-hmm. And we're trained as actors to to use our imagination in that way so that you know, we we see things, we feel things, taste things, uh, 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 almost like, um, uh, you know, we, we can conjure these things up out of thin air, like a magician. And so when I was writing, for instance, let's say the loss part um, in the mm-hmm. book, when she's had mm-hmm. big losses, um, mm-hmm. I was able to do like a little exercise and feel the loss of the people and the things in my life and okay. write through that. So, so what we've learned is to have a way of creating feelings because actors are athletes of their emotions. And so what we're able to do is to, to bring that up instantly. Um, yeah. and, and I did that in my writing and I was able to write through my feelings. So there's a lot of funny places in the book, too. And so, you know, I bring up my sitcom, my, you know, the part of my, my mentality, my emotions that are, you know, funny, that, that, right. that would make me laugh. And, you know, so it was really helpful. In fact, for all writers, I suggest they take an acting class. Yeah, that's- such good advice, I think, for anybody who might be having a hard time getting in touch with their emotions. You know the thing we need to do as writers, and mm-hmm. I think that is to let go of our intellectual mm-hmm. side. I know that sounds peculiar, but mm-hmm. the first draft should be just an emotional draft mm-hmm. um, of the feelings of the, of, of the world that you're in, uh, the yeah. feelings of the characters, and then... The second draft, you come in and you find some of the right words and the, the way, the phrasing. I mean, there's, there's, there's a journey that writers need to take, which is that, that many times I think they're, a, a beginning writer is very mm-hmm. turned off because he can't get past the first sentence because it's mm-hmm. not the right words and the punctuation is all wrong. And, you know, and yeah. I've, I've learned, forgive me for using this word, but I've learned to vomit out my feelings and my, mm-hmm. my ideas onto the page and then edit it. Yes. You know, later, yes. later. Don't worry about what, how, sometimes some of my best writing has been in the kernel of all of that. Oh, see, that's really good to know. That's great advice for, I think, any writer, but certainly for somebody who's just starting out. Yes, to is start out. Uh, and, and also, you know, I also suggest for people, let's say someone is not a writer per se and doesn't want to take the career of writing, but has wanted to write about their family, for their children, to pass on uh, the heritage of, of the, their, what they know about their family. And so my idea has always been, and I suggest, is to take a, a tape recorder, I guess that's what you still call it, um, and mm-hmm. to sit down with a best friend or a relative and have that person ask you questions and just tell, it doesn't have to start at the beginning, just tell stories that you remember and that have been told 
and then to transcribe it with something called Dragonware. There's a software that transcribes what you say. And then okay. you have maybe 20, 30 pages already of a, it's all mixed up and like a puzzle, but there's the story. And then you can sit down and organize it like a, and, and make some sense of it. And you've got your family's uh, life there and um, without even worrying about writing it. Sharon, you did a lot of research uh, with regard to Charlie and Wells Fargo and, and just, you know, for people who don't understand what the whip actually means, do you mind kind of explaining a little bit of that? Of course. <laughs> I have some people thinking it's a, a, a bit of a sadomasochistic book or something. No, the yes. whip in the old days was a stagecoach driver. And um, because they held the whip on the stagecoach. And um, they were like the rock stars of their time, by the way. Um, you know, the, all the girls would wait at all the way stations to, to not get their autograph, but to give them cookies and, and, and cakes because they yeah. were all in love, all, all the girls and the children were in love with the, with the whips. So that's what that is. And in terms of research, oh, my God. You know, of course, any period you have to research uh, a lot. But one of the things I didn't think I was going to have to encounter was, you know, when, we, when, we, like, when we're having conversation in the book, I had to check each word to make sure that that word was used in the, eight, say, the mid-1800s. Um, for instance, like, we use the word okay. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I looked that word up, and by the way, it was used around 1847, um, 48, um, because it sounded like an Indian, American Indian word. Um, and when the Indians used to say yes, they would buy the beads or whatever it was uh, in exchange for gold. <laughs> um, right say a word and it sounded like okay and so we Americans picked that word out. I mean of course the Indians are Americans they were the first Americans but I'm just saying the uh, European Americans picked that word up um, and we got okay so I found out there were many words I couldn't use um, because they just were not in existence. That was just that, let alone about Wells Fargo and about how long it took for a stage to coach to travel from uh, Santa Cruz to San Francisco and, and what the streets were like in San Francisco. Were there lights on stage coaches? How did they drive at night? How many horses and the teams and how you drove? And I had to go to a, I went to a, a wild Mustang ranch in Utah and spent several days with the wild mustangs and was trained about horses. And, I mean, it was an endless, that's why it took six years. You also have done an audible version yes. with actress Robin Weiger, who people know from uh, Deadwood. The show yeah, she, HBO she played Deadwood. Calamity Jane on Deadwood. She was nominated for an Emmy. Um, and by the way, may I say, I'm very proud of her, that she went in Sundance at the Sundance Festival. She got the, the breakout performance of the year in something called Concussion, a movie which she's starring in and is probably going to be released this year. So I had an auntie who was blind, and I, I, I feel strongly for that wanting to help in, uh, like there's a place in San Francisco that I'm going to in about a week. Uh, it's called The Lighthouse, and it is the, it's a library as well as a foundation and a, a gathering place for the people in San Francisco who are challenged with their sight. And they're all over America, in fact. And um, I'm thrilled that this book can be helpful and, and maybe entertain them. So going back to Charlie's story, how did the whole idea or inspiration come to you for this book, besides reading about her, I guess? Uh, slowly it came to me, but you know what I did first? It was interesting. I, um, somebody said to me a long time ago, what a wonderful film this would make. So I wrote a, a screenplay. Not a very good one, but it was, um, it was, uh, taken on by a, a, a giant 
agency called William Morris, and they sold it to a, a, a Canadian producer named Kevin Sullivan, who's very well known in Canada. And um, he, but at that time, this was before HBO and Showtime and cable, and so you know it was not exactly cross-dressing was not exactly what CBS was looking for at the time, and so right. never made it. And so I put it in a trunk. And that's what I did is that I dug it out like maybe 10 years later. And I, and I, a girlfriend kept un, bothering me about writing a novel out of it. And so um, I did. And now I'm rewriting the uh, screenplay. As oh, you we, are? Yes, I am. I'm on the second draft of it now. Well, that will be exciting. I, I wish you the, all the best. So, um, have there been any kind of unexpected reactions to the book? There was an article on, it's called Advocate. It is the transgender and gay and lesbian newspaper in Los Angeles. And they did an interview. And they uh, asked me about Charlie's proclivities. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, I, I took her story... Uh, her true story, and I put all the facts in, and then I novelized the rest of it. That's why it is on the cover, um, Mm -hmm. a novel inspired by a true story. Okay. Right, right. But many years ago, I was friends with um, Maxine Andrews of the Andrews Sisters, and she had a T-shirt, and on the T-shirt was Charlie Parker's name. And I said, what are all those women's names on your T-shirt? And she said, they're all gay icons, lesbian icons. I said, because at that time I had known, I hadn't started writing yet, but I knew about her. And I said, was Charlie Parker's gay? And she said, well, we consider her gay. We take her as an icon. Who knew and who who knows? Because... yeah. Because there's no facts about that. But, I, right. you know, in those days, the only way that a woman could travel, the only way that a woman could have a life of any kind and live her dreams was to put on men's clothes, put on britches, and just, you know, take on that life. And I don't know if you know this and your listeners, that there were many women during this, the Civil War who fought in the Civil War as men and were never found out. Um, and uh, the only way some of them were found out is their but dead bodies were found. Um, wow. but, but many of them fought and, and were okay and went home and had three children. So, you know, uh, just because in our day and age, we would probably jump to the conclusion that a woman who lives her life as a man is probably transgender or uh, gay. Uh, right. But, you know, I mean, for those who don't know better, um, maybe a woman just would like to have an experience of what that's like. But right. I was going to say, in those days, you could be straight. Uh, you just did it out of protection or out of living your dreams. That's all. And I, yeah. I decided that Charlie put on her clothes for revenge to travel and also, finally, to live the life of freedom and to live her life as, as only men then could Yes, it's amazing how much has changed in, to this day and age. And if they could look, if Charlie could look forward to see that she ended up being a role model, I, I think that would probably shock her. <laughs> oh, that's absolutely right. And it's yeah. interesting that I think I mentioned that she was the first woman to vote in America as a man that we know of. Yeah. Um, she voted for General Grant. <laughs> um, and it, what's interesting about that, by the way, is that. A little side note is that Mm -hmm. she died of uh, mouth cancer from smoking too many cigars and too much chewing tobacco and liquor, and so did General Grant. Same thing. But but, uh, nonetheless, um, imagine that I wonder when she was making her mark on her ballot, if she was thinking, I wonder if I'm the first woman to do this. Yes, I know. Wouldn't that be fascinating? Now, um, one very large highlight of your acting career was when you won the Los Angeles Drama Award for Best Actress in the Room 2. What's fascinating is that Tennessee Williams saw you in that, and then he gave you carte blanche to 
any of his work uh, during his lifetime. Now, can you talk a little bit about meeting him? And my gosh, I can't even imagine what that would be like. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, a, a friend of mine said, what did I want for my birthday while I was doing Rose Tattoo? And I just, as a joke, said, ah, Tennessee Williams coming to Rose Tattoo. Well, the funny thing is, it was such a serendipity thing. He never came to Los, to California, particularly Los Angeles, which he didn't like that much. Um, but he came for a play that he wanted to see in Long Beach, um, Eccentricities of a Nightingale, which is based on his summer in smoke. Um, and while he was here, my friend, who was a talk host, um, got in touch with him, made the agreement. He was looking forward to that and, and arranged for him to come. Now, what's funny is before he arrived, I, am a, I met him at a drama critic circle luncheon. And I had cleavage, I had cleavage, I had a low cut dress, and he kept staring across the table at my cleavage. Now, we all know that Mr. Williams, uh, his proclivities were that he was gay. And I, so I was wondering, anyway, we're introduced, he looks at me and he said, hmm, he looks down at my breast, he goes, may I touch them? And I said, um, oh, well, well, yes, of course. He very gently and gentlemanly put his hands on my breast, and, and he started laughing, and he said, Oh, I'll take them, gift-wrapped. <laughs> and that was our first introduction. <laughs> oh, my gosh, what a wonderful story. He sounds like such a character. Oh, he was a character, and he was lovely. And, he, and so after he saw the rose tattoo, um, he really, really uh, enjoyed it and liked it. And so he, because I had produced that, I didn't, uh, what happened was I almost died, and my, and, 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 which I won't go into, uh, as a young woman, and my parents took a chunk of money and said, what is your dream? And my dream was to do this play. I was a member of the Actors Studio, and Lee Strasberg, who was my teacher, had always encouraged me to do this play, The Rose Tattoo. So I put together The Rose Tattoo, not even knowing you're supposed to get the rights. I knew nothing. Finally, of course, I did. And out of all of that, did the play, produced it, William saw it. After that, he gave me the rights to all of his plays, for as long as he was alive, um, and that's the next one I did was with Ed, a young, Ed, gorgeous, sexy Ed Harris. Um, and we did The Great Sweet Bird of Youth, one of William's plays. Um, and then after that, I did a, another one called The Vukare, um, with a, a, a wonderful actor named Ray Strickland. Ray Strickland. Um, and so, you know, it began my, 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 my confidence, because I'd been very shy until then, and, and, you know, one of the reasons that I didn't do better in my youth as an actor is that I would, you know, walk into walls. I was looking at my feet all the time when I walked into auditions. I was so shy, and so it, it gave me a lot of encouragement and confidence. One, that's wonderful to impart to people, especially, um, you know, I have a daughter who's 13, and she's, she's a little shy as well. So I, I will have her listen to this. I think that's wonderful. Do you have any kind of writing quirks or a specific writing routine that you stick to while you're writing your books? <laughs> well, I write for some reason late at night from, like, 11 at night until 5 in the morning. Because I guess it's because it's quiet. And I drink a lot of coffee. I think it was Hemingway, by the way, who said, somebody asked him, how do you write? And he said, well, I sit down in front of a typewriter and I bleed. <laughs> yes. I, I guess I, I feel like I'm dreaming more. I get into a dream state late at night. Um, fantasy state easier. I think that's why I choose to do that. And how do you write? I mean, what is your quirk? I do have music on. Typically, it's something sort of moody. I listen to a lot of Tori Amos, but I'm very inspired by her lyrics. She's just an amazing lyricist. I would love for her to write a book one day because I just think she's so talented with words. 
Wow. So any kind of words that inspire me, but the music, I, I like more sort of quiet or moodier music as opposed to like blasting, you know, death metal or something yes. like that. Yes, you know, I was... Or, I, I just you just gave me an idea for the new writers, and that would be that whatever if they can't take an acting class or two and access emotions is to whatever mood it is that they're trying to capture to put on the music of that particular mood, you yeah. know, choose yeah. each each particular emotion and then choose a piece of music. Maybe that might help. Yeah. Now with your writing. When you got to through all those different drafts, did you have uh, a group of authors that you worked with to run things by, or did you had did you sign with that publishing house? Let's talk about your publishing journey, working with an editor and all that kind of. Stuff. Okay, um, uh, no, I didn't have a group. I had a couple of best friends who are writers that I gave it to, um, mm-hmm. and they gave me notes. Uh, then I just over, then I read the book out loud. And then I had, I, I hired a young man who sat with me. He did two things. He formatted the book for me beautifully. And he would read out loud the book to me. And I would listen. Because if you read the book, there's a rhythm to the book. Um, people have actually, actually Robin Weikert, when she was uh, reading the book, uh, narrating it, she said she felt the rhythm of it. Almost a kind of um, musical, poetic uh, f- feel to it. And, mm-hmm. and so by listening to the book out loud, it helped me a lot. And this poor man, I had him read it over and over again. <laughs> um, so uh, that was one thing. And then in terms of the publication of the book, if this book has had nothing but serendipity. The right people and the right things have come into the life of this book magically. And I use that word carefully, but for the book it is magically. Um, I had finished the book, the last draft, the 27th draft, um, and I thought, oh no, now I have to do the dreaded proposal, that, that submission to you know, publishers, and it's supposed to be so difficult. Um, and so I just thought, okay, well, I did the book. Now I have to learn to do the proposal. So I, um, one day I was thinking about it, and the phone rang. <laughs> and it was um, um, a, a, a friend who said another friend was going to be emailing me something from Transylvania. I said, what? Anyway, he said, expect the email. Okay, so I got this email from somebody that I hadn't spoken to in 30 years from Transylvania with the vampires, or Dracula Mm -hmm. lived there. And and he was the man who took the photographs of my, when Tennessee Williams, the night of Tennessee Williams, coming to the show. Okay. Wow. And he emailed me and asked me if I would contact a publisher because they wanted to put the cover... Uh, of the book with this Tennessee Williams picture <clears throat> for the centennial of Williams. Would I do him a favor since he was in Transylvania? So I did. I called the publisher. I handled it for him. And the, while I'm talking to the publisher, he said, oh, by the way, what do you do? And I told him. And he said, oh, what is your book about? I told him. He said, send me a couple of chapters. I did. A week later, he said, send me the book. I did. And a week later, he said, we'd like to buy it. Oh, my goodness. So that's how easy it was. Yeah. And then it was, a, it was a boutique, it is a boutique publishing house in uh, the East Coast, which does particular kind of genre uh, books. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so I called, I, I had a contact with CAA, which is a very, very big um, agency if people don't know it's the one where all the Academy Award actors are with um, and I called somebody there in the publishing department in the sorry in the literary department and asked them about this company and they said they didn't know the company but yes go with the boutique house I said why they said because if you signed with like a random house uh, immediately with your new debut novel 
and it didn't do well, that they would be taking symbolically, taking it off the shelves um, in just a couple of months and not putting any clout behind it because it wasn't selling. But if you sell it to a boutique or smaller publishing house, they will do it forever because they want to get their money back. Oh, that's very good advice, actually. That makes a lot uh, of sense. Yes, so I signed with this man. He has a wonderful uh, distribution. He has Baker and & Taylor and, and Ingram, you know, which are the big dis- distribution companies. Um, right not only in America, but all over the world. And by the way, I'm very excited. I found out that the book has been selling a bit in Great Britain and Germany. Oh, that's wonderful. I know. So I'm thinking of, I may be taking a trip to London for other reasons, and I have a friend who has some contacts in London, and I may do some book signings there. How fun. You know, Europeans are fascinated by Westerns, obviously, Italy and the spaghetti Westerns way back, you know, with Clint Eastwood. But it's very interesting that the Europeans are picking up on that. I think that's wonderful, especially for you. Lily, the Germans. Did you know that the Germans are mad, mad about Westerns, more so than the Italians? And, in fact, I have a German friend who told me that many Germans come to America in their boots and hats, uh, ah. looking like cowboys, because they kind That's of expect great. they expect America to be looking a lot like you know cowboys. Yeah. Now you do tra- you mentioned traveling. You do travel quite a bit. I've seen your pictures on Facebook with regard to your South America trip and. Um, uh, you've been, I'm sure, all over the world. Was it more from your acting that you traveled and developed a love of travel, or where did that interest, or is it researching books? Where did that come from? My parents started me on on cruising. The, they, they they got me addicted to cruising. Two, three years ago, I took a a cruise around the world, um, a 90 day cruise, which was. Wow. Amazing, and I wrote a, a, a blog home and um, photographs. And you know what I find is that the the experience of traveling, of course, is so helpful as a writer, and it opens yes. up mind in ways that you can't even imagine. And the last trip on the Seaborn to South America, I went to Machu Picchu and Easter Island as well. Um, they, I did a book signing on the ship. Oh, on the ship! Wow, that's Right. Yes. So I, may, I have about two more questions. Um, one is, um, uh, can you share what your next work is? Are you are you writing a screenplay or are you writing another book? Uh, anything you can share with the reader? Well, as I mentioned, I am uh, doing this last this uh, draft of the screenplay of the Whip, but right. um, I am working on a new book, and it's called Looking for Jack Kerouac. Although it's not about Jack Kerouac, it is oh. a the, the, the point of the book is, I'll tell you very quickly, it's that when I was a girl, I was in love with Jack Kerouac. He was, again, the rock star of our time, my time. Mm-hmm. And I was about 12, 13, and I used to wander around uh, North Beach in San Francisco where I was growing up with my guitar and my long hair and looking for him. And I'd go to the City Lights bookstore, and they'd say, no, he's across the street. And I'd go across the street, and they'd go, no, he's over there. And I'd go over there, and he wasn't there. Well, this went on and on. And I never found Jack Kerouac. Okay. So... And then he died, and I realized that how, lu- how lucky, how fortunate and lucky I was because Jack Kerouac loved 12 and 13 and 14-year-old girls. So I was protected. So yes. my book is going to be about my life um, and how everything in my life, e- the, even the things that I wanted and didn't, didn't get, I was protected. Mm, so that's it's really it's, important. It, it's going to be a, a, a fictional memoir about my life. Um, and I say fictional because, you know, I want to make it also literary in terms of being able to make it interesting, um, sure. well as the facts. But, but it's, it, the, the underlying theme of the book is that when we don't get sometimes always what we want in life, it is because we are protected and later we see that yes 
I think that's a wonderful message. Um, and I can't, for one, can't wait to read it. So um, I, I'm excited about that. My final question is, and you probably have heard this many times, and I know people ask me this as well, offer advice to any aspiring author. What would you give that? What advice would you give? Be, uh, be willing to accept Hemingway's words <laughs> that to, yes. write, to, to write a great, great book or hopefully a good book, you have to bleed, and that is emotionally as well as physically, meaning uh, you have to give up a lot of your life to write, meaning instead of you know, going out and playing golf and going to the beach, you know, you're sitting behind a computer or uh, behind a yellow legal pad, and my first draft is always written, handwritten. Uh, other than that, you have to be really, really passionate about what it is that you want to write about. Otherwise, you'll give up um, because it's too hard, and it requires, you, you, it requires too much. I believe that ultimately the theme of the book always has to resonate um, and help others. It doesn't matter if it's a novel or it's a uh, nonfiction uh, of nonfiction always helps usually, but a novel and people don't think of novels as having, uh, like I said in my book, the the river that runs through my book is is about forgiveness. And if you cannot forgive, how far would you go? Um, and what does that do to you? Um, so it's always about the reader. It's always about the person. You're always giving, is what I'm trying to say. Yes. Yes, and I think that when you when people read the book, they will see that. It, I don't know that. Um, I think everybody brings to a story that they read their own impressions, obviously, but I think that comes across as very clear. And I, and I think that for any author, by because you need some kind of underlying theme that's going to allow you to write your story. To allow your story and help the reader, assist, exactly. like, even if it's subliminally, uh, to give the reader uh, some hope or to help them. I mean, one last thing I'd like to say is there was a woman who wrote to me. I got letters from all over the United States, emails about the book. But one lady in particular wrote to me and said, my husband just died. My son tried to commit suicide. We lost our home. I have no insurance. I hang out at the library. I saw your book in the new book section. I liked the cover. I was attracted to it. I took it. I read it. And she said, I'm writing to you to thank you. Because she said, if that character, Charlie Parker, could survive what she survived, I can too. And so I'm very grateful that you know, I was able to, even if it's one one person, to help. Mm -hmm. That's what I think ultimately a book uh, needs to do for the reader. It needs to resonate in such a way that it, it actually can change someone's life, maybe. Yes, that's an amazing story. Uh, I'm so glad that someone shared that with you. And I think that that's what's so wonderful about your book, is it's such a strong female character, despite the difficulties that she has throughout her life. And that, that's so important for all women to see, I think, what, what our ancestors or our history, what we're capable of. That's and that's what I really love about the story. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Well, thank you for joining me today. I'm so excited that I was able to interview you. I appreciate it. Right. Thank it. you so much, Karen. Have a thank wonderful day and a wonderful um, Good luck on writing your on your next work. Thank you, thank you, and we'll talk later. Okay. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this Audible Authors interview. You can find more interviews at audibleauthors.net and thousands of book reviews at sanfranciscobookreview.com, sacramentobookreview.com, and our partner book review at portlandbookreview.com.